Rochelle and I first met about 10 years ago. Rochelle, are you back? Can you hear us? Okay. Oh, I think we can hear you. Can you with us? I wonder if we're in some exotic location where we still don't have access. Karen, it's nice to see you. Lizzie, can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear us? Nope. Oh, there she goes. Oh, now you're moving. I think we don't have enough bandwidth for your connection to come through, Rochelle. If you turn your video off, do you think that you, we can hear you? Let's see, you're muted now. Let's unmute you. That will help. Oh, I can't unmute you. Hang on, everyone. We've been having Zoom shenanigans all. Oh, there she goes. Camera's off. I turned the camera off to see if maybe the connection would be better. It is. And we can hear you. I feel like maybe that's unfortunately what needs to um, I'm not sure what's going on, so please forgive um, my sensitivity with six of my nine planets in Mercury, in Mercury retrograde, <laughs> or, or in planets ruled by Mercury. So maybe that's it, or I'm not sure. I'm very happy, and I hope you can. Yes, um, I can hear you. It's still cutting out a little bit on the audio side. So we'll okay. just, we'll just uh, um, maybe even, I wonder if we turn off our videos as well. Does that affect the bandwidth for Rochelle? I can also try to maybe um, not be on the Wi-Fi and be on the... Oh, you have a connection straight to the... Internet. Yeah, just uh, forgive me. Oh, no, it's all good. Well, while you do that, I was just going to give a little introduction of how we first crossed paths. Okay, great. Talk for a minute while we do that. So I was looking back in old journals and trying to figure out the first time we were sitting in a little room together in Santa Margarita with Wendy McKenna, but I think it was around Cricket's first birthday. It was about 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and when I think about that phase and what we were about to embark on, I really think about how you were gathering energy and inspiration and resources around you for what was about to be the beginning of a really epic heroine's journey and a journey that could be framed in lots and lots of different ways. But um, through our through our mystic society lens, we spend a lot of time talking about the journey to right livelihood and the journey um, into sacred commerce and the ways in which we invite the divine feminine and invite beauty way and flow to support us on that journey. And I don't think we quite knew 10 years ago how much you were really going to be living that and modeling that and creating a platform and a movement around those um, values and ideals so um, intimately and, and also explicitly. So I just, I, I want to encourage everyone listening here today to be listening to the story, not only from the place of all that you have accomplished, which I'm excited to dive into what Koya is and the book and, um, and lifestyle of reverence, but also be listening for the themes of the journey to right livelihood and the ways in which Rochelle allowed herself to be journeyed and be in the inquiry and be in the not knowing. And um, hoping, Rochelle, you'll give us a little bit of uh, clues into how that journey unfolded for you. Would you be willing to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit how you, how you navigated that journey and where you are today? Of course. So yes, when, when we met 10 years ago, it was a very different time. It's amazing how much has happened. And in this present moment, in 2016, in the middle of May, um, my name is Rochelle Sheik. I'm the creator of Koya. Sometimes it feels more accurate to say, instead of creating Koya, that Koya has been creating me, which has been a big part of what I would say in really that prayer of offering over, saying, you know, I want to be of service. Please, to spirit, to my higher self, to my intuition, just tell me what to do, and I'll do it. Like, if the message is clear, I'll move forward. And what the messages I've been receiving began with creating a movement system for women based on the idea through movement we remember our essence is wise, wild, and free. And then wise, wild, and free draw reference to the movement forms we practice. Wise, calling on the wisdom of yoga. Wild, the creative expression and dance. Free, expanding our capacity to enjoy being in our bodies through more feminine-based sensual movement that also evolved into 
honoring when we remember that it's not just about doing it in a dance class or on a retreat, but that we remember the physical sensation of truth in our body so intimately that we use that as north on our compass to guide, do I put my kids in this school or that school, take this job or that job, and that we're constantly self-referencing our body like a tuning fork and really seeing if something resonates as truth. And if it doesn't, we no longer are willing to go against ourselves anymore. So it's like training an army of dancers in a way who stand for love by understanding what love and truth feel like in the body. It's, it's so beautiful. How, so tell us about how those pieces of you integrated in order to bring this forward. Because I know for so many who are stepping out on this journey of right livelihood, we feel like it comes from this place of grand inspiration, this strategic plan. Then we put this plan in motion. But your story actually involved a lot of leaning into the divine feminine in order to bring it forward. You allowed yourselves periods of pause, periods of left turn, period of sitting in the not knowing. Can you tell us a little bit about how you allowed yourself to be journeyed towards Koya in this way or how Koya maybe called you towards it? Yes. Well, it's so interesting because I say that the beginning of my journey, I could really trace it back to reading The Alchemist, which was, if you follow your heart, the world will conspire on your behalf. And that was the main teaching from the book. So I really felt inspired to offer that as an experiment, you know, just mm -hmm. what, what if the world actually works that way? And I just started listening to what was true in my heart. And that would be like, go to India. That would be like, you know, sign up for massage school. That would be like, you know, do all these things. Didn't like go yoga teacher training. So over the course of about 10 years, I was really allowing myself to follow what my passions were and where I felt called. And a lot of it didn't make any linear sense at right. all. And actually when I met you and we were doing the energy healing um, with Wendy McKenna, at that time, the message that I was getting was just have fun, like just play. <laughs> and I was like, this is ridiculous. You know, it's like in our culture, there's such a glorification of struggle and being stressed out. It's like, oh, taking time to play is like, but you know, whenever I did get a clear message, I also would be so willing to work hard, mm -hmm. but it really, it really was not just like overnight. It was when Koya came as as a opportunity to understand how to really take all these things that I've been learning and studying and offer them to someone else in a crystallized way where I'd gotten what the essence of the message is. It's like, if I only meet someone one time, if they only come to my class once, if they only read one blog post, if they get one thing from the book, what is it? And the message that came through was through movement. We remember it's like the body is a portal to our essence and and also that embodiment is, is really the point. It's really what differentiates us being from being here on earth as a spirit incarnate from not. Like embodiment's the whole thing. And so that coming to clarity took a while. I, I really feel like consciousness is moving more quickly for those of us that, <laughs> that are like, they're like, I don't have 10 years. I don't think it will take you that long. I'm just saying it did. And it was a lot of earnest prayer. Like it was just... It was just and it, one specific earnest prayer of like, just honestly, if you make it clear, I promise I'll do it. Oh, that's powerful. Is that how yeah. you begin your day? Yeah. I mean, I'm in a place of reinvention. Koya just hit its seven year cycle. So I feel like it's really like, I love it. I'm enchanted with it. I feel like it'll be part of my life forever. And then I also feel like, what is the next iteration? Mm -hmm. And so I'm really working. I'm taking this summer off to go travel and make myself available for that next vision. And when I say take the summer off, it means, you know, I'll be teaching and traveling, but I, sure. I'll just be doing something out of my ordinary schedule. Oh, so. that's so exciting. You're really modeling, creating that space for the next yeah. inspiration to drop in for you. Has that been a recurring pattern for you across the last seven years since Koya came into form of creating intentional pauses? Yeah, I feel like it's so much of the work that I offer people is mm -hmm. the retreats. And it's like, in some ways it can look like, oh, you know, you're going to this beautiful place in Costa Rica or this or that. But it's really, it's, it's all about the metaphor. It's like getting out of the mundane and then making a gesture to yourself of your willingness to, to travel far externally can sometimes be this willingness to travel far internally. Mm -hmm. And it's 
just about creating like a really sacred space. Now, people don't have to go to Costa Rica. You don't have to go on these places. You can do it in your own home. You can do it for 15 minutes at lunch. But sometimes I really like the embodiment of things. So but for me, it's like going on these bigger pilgrimage-like journeys. So I put, find myself in a place without Wi-Fi, you know, in, in a language like where that I'm not fluent and like all these things that create conditions for me to just get what is the center of my truth. And, you know, sometimes I do that at home. Sometimes I do that by going to, by taking a bath, (laughs) but intentional pauses. And I think that real feminine of like knowing when, when a mother gives birth to a child is expansion, contraction, expansion, contraction. And a lot of times we get really irritated when our body feels the call to contract, but I feel really clear that it's part of the birthing. So it's like really take that time. Like something huge and expansive happens. It's like I need to clear my schedule and like have as much downtime as I can. That's reasonable. You know, we have modern lifestyles, but uh, the conscious contraction is something I'm really passionate about. Absolutely. And I love that you're, you're willing to bring into the fold that there's a willingness to work hard. There's a willingness to, when there's clarity, I can take steps and I can move things forward. And I also will, create space for the pause and create space for the counterbalancing energies. Do you also have practices around intentionally calling forth or manifesting? What are your thoughts around manifestation? So my thoughts on manifestation and working hard are kind of similar. It's kind of like, it's not about what you do or don't do, but the consciousness within which you do it. Mm -hmm. So when you're in, when I'm engaging in something and it's like, oh, I'm working hard, but I'm really struggling and suffering from it, I'm really aware that it will hold that energetic vibration. And that's just, you know, that's just how it is. And so I try to do my best to bring myself in the most best feeling place. And that's a lot of what Koya is, is like, how can I feel not only as good as possible, but just the most like myself, what is the most authentic, resonant feeling I can have with myself and then create from there. So in peak moments of experience, whether that be dancing, whether that be relaxation, whether that be orgasm, when you're feeling the most attuned to self, that's the time where I really encourage people to visualize and manifest and like, how do you want it to feel? And like visualize that. And then also what can you do in your life so that it feels that way? So that's like um, very inspired, like articular, so Mm -hmm. articulately expressed by Daniel Laporte and the desire map. It's like whatever you want, realizing more than wanting that is like you probably want the way that you think that thing is going to feel. And then how can you create that feeling now? Like I really wanted a partner for a long time. Yeah. And I just kept saying, if I had a partner, I feel like it would feel cozy. And so cozy became one of my core desired feelings where I was just always, you know, like getting hot tea and blankets and I'd stay in a lot. And I was just like really like marinating and cozy. And I've, I've re- been recently have a new partner about five or six months. And it's like, it is so cozy. <laughs> but it was, that wasn't like an overnight thing. That was years yes. of, of really bringing clarity. But I like, I wasn't sitting there whining. Yeah. about the partner. It was just like marinating in the feeling. Yes. We, we talk a lot in the mystics about the prism process and how creating holograms and prisms of what we desire create surface area for the experience. And so hearing you say you were living from that place of your, your cozy core desired feeling makes me see you in the center of your prism and having mm. that forth. That's beautiful. Love that. So one of the things that comes up a lot in our world as we're having conversations around manifestation and new paradigm business is that people can feel, especially women can feel stuck bringing their desires into form. And we talk about the manifestation life cycle. We talk about, you know, starting with that intention and that desire and that visualization of what we want. Then we often experience in the community frustration as we move around the wheel to the places of receiving and claiming. And it's, it's, there's obviously a lot that goes into this, but part of what I love about Koya and its um, ability to access movement and sensual movement and dance and meditation is that it brings forth that embodiment piece that it feels to me really needs to be in place for us to create and form, that we actually need to have feet on earth and have deep roots down and know what it means to be in and of our bodies in order to manifest. Um, But what goes along with that is we also bump into a lot of individual and collective trauma as we move down the chakras and move Mm -hmm. down into the body. 
I'm wondering how does Koya make space for that? And what is your take on how we as individuals and the collective are, are literally creating the rituals and the movement practices? And your movement is certainly a huge piece of that in my mind to shift these wounds and to bring us into a place where, where we're manifesting as a collective. Mm, so many beautiful things there. I do think there's definitely a correlation between embodiment and then also manifesting in the mm -hmm. way that they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's like infusing spirit into form. Right. So like the ability to come into embodiment in your body, like your understanding of that, your savoring of that, your and and savoring of that and not that it's like so easy and pleasurable, but like of of the nuances of the experience sure. and being able to come into right relationship with your own embodiment sure. allows a map of manifesting in, in, in other things in form, infusing your spirit, your desires, your intentions also into form. And one of the things that comes up for me a lot when as I talk to people about going on this path and following your intuition and following the truth in your body is that it's a real transition from egoic thinking to feeling the body and that you have to like you can't think your way into it like there's so many powerful ways of like mantras and this and that but that's really just to bring the mind back into the present moment so it can actually feel the power of the present moment sure in in my in my perspective and so one of the, the things that I often say is being able to release expectations and realizing the success of the moment is not that I had this clear intention and I manifested it exactly the way that I thought is that I basically, I got to, the, I did all the, all the things to get to the most true place for me in the moment. I set out that intention, that manifestation. I stepped in that direction and that the moment of success and celebration is that I aligned myself with something that was true for me. Mm. And so the, the moment of celebration and success is not waiting for expectations to be met, but just the courageous living of like, it's kind of like whatever happens, mm -hmm. I'm celebrating that there's space for me in this world to align and I'm celebrating my hope and I'm celebrating this new paradigm that we're all working out. And it's like, it's not fully created yet. We're, we're dropping the crystal grid, right? <laughs> You know, person by person, by taking those steps of, of earnestness of like, I know who I am as a being. And I know if I ask for help, I will receive it because I'm not asking some other. I'm asking the most evolved part of myself, which is the one consciousness. Mm -hmm. Like, so it's like, it's the, but in terms of coming up against that trauma and anything that creates a separation schism, like it is real. And, and I really believe it's like that cliche. It's like, you have to feel it to heal it. Right. And, and, and I also believe that through movement, ritual, ceremony, community, pilgrimage, nature, um, it, it can actually be these practices that bring you into the present moment. I believe all healing happens in the present moment mm -hmm. where it's like, it's so, it's so fascinating because I think like the cutting edge of my understanding and leading so many women through these practices is that if you go into the shadow and you go into the grief and you just take at least one deep breath and you feel all of it, that's the portal to your joy because you experience the gift of it if you feel it. But if you're just in the thinking about it, it's horrific. Yes. But if you just feel it, for, for not, you don't have to hold, feel it forever, but just for one moment, it's like so many times it's like it's again I, it's like you know the darker the night the brighter the star it's like those those really traumatic moments in our lives like allowed us to interface with to rise to heal to grow and so it's something also it's like you don't want to be new agey and you don't want to be an asshole and tell someone that their grief is their portal to their joy because whatever their human experience is is very very real for them and the things that are real for me and if someone said that to me I'd tell them to be quiet <laughs> But, but the thing is just in really watching people in transformational evolutionary of consciousness practices, I, I, I personally do believe in the loving kindness of this universe and the only thing that needs to be shifted is really our perception of it. And the, the most efficient way I know to do that is by feeling everything in my body mm -hmm. and by feeling the duality, I have access to the non-dual. Mm, exactly. Oh, talk about so much goodness in that. Um, I, I know there's lots of, like, we have our videos off, but I know there's a lot of all body nods out there too. We have 
Carrie Nola with us who um, just gifted me with her beautiful shadow deck and is deeply walking this path of mm -hmm. how um, in coming to see the shadow and shining the light on the shadow, we actually can be present with it and then therefore bring forward its gifts. I, we're certainly going to make room for some questions at the end. I would love to hear what's come up for you, Carrie, in, in, in this conversation. Um, but I also want to underscore one thing in particular that you said, Rochelle. So, so often this wound that we bump up against, whether it's our own or our past life or our collective, um, collective piece of the, the ancestry or, or conscious, it's this wound that was encapsulated in the past. And I completely agree with you that healing happens in the present. And I think what's so exciting about Koya and the rituals and practices in this combination, you know, all the way from movement to nature that brings us into the present is it it doesn't have to be scary and heavy the way it might mm -hmm. be a place that we think of, say, psychotherapy. And, and I have full appreciation for psychotherapy in its place as well. But we don't have to sit and stew and marinate in the wound from the place mm -hmm. of movement and ritual and ceremony. We actually get to be present with it and allow it to bring its gifts forward. So I think it does shift our relationship to grief and it shifts our our knowing of what it is to face our wounds up close and personal. Do you see that to be true as well? Definitely. Like I personally experienced so much depth and healing in my own life, but then also others in the arc of a Koya class. Right. That there's like a gentle warm up, dancing our yoga is prayer, shadow dance. And then, but it's sometimes what I say is like all the courage that it takes to descend into the underworld. We need to also cultivate the courage to rise and ascend, which is the next practice after the shadow dance, which is the shaking. And it's really inspired by the story of so many animals, but specifically I use the story of the gazelle, that a gazelle is being chased by a lion in the grasslands, the gazelle gets away, it doesn't hide under you know, a patch of leaves for the rest of its life, there might be a lion, is what a gazelle does is it shakes out every part of its body, it shakes the fear and the trauma and comes back to its essence and being a gazelle and, and goes on with its life. And, it's, and so this ability for us to feel and honor, I think honor is really the word, yeah. like honor, and then at the same time, not let any life experience, positive or negative, anchor us in the past and miss yeah. the gift of the forever now and the conscious awareness. And so I really, so then after that in a Koya class, we, we shake, but then the next piece is a choreographed dance piece. So it's like we might be doing, you know, the grapevine, the box step, the Charleston, and it's very intentionally there as like, you know, just like a little bit of a sigh of relief. Like everyone loves a flash mob, you know? <laughs> and I think the other thing is really being able to understand like individual and collective grief. Yeah. And I think so many times with our pain is we start to feel really isolated versus really understand, like, as far as I can tell, no one is so exempt from the human journey. You know, these are, these are, these are initiations we all go through. So when we can come together in community and cry together and, and find the gratitude together and do all those things together it's like we get so much inspiration from holding space for others. We get so much support from others holding space for us. And I think a big, big, big like construction block on the road that keeps people is when they are isolated in their yes. grief. Yes. So it doesn't have to be scary. So you can do yeah. it in a circle with your sisters. It can move through and not only move, but deliver you to this place of ascending. Um, just for everyone listening, so I did share a little video off of YouTube of um, the shaking practice. It's one of my favorite practices, especially as someone who can run kind of hummingbird energy or high energy or can be um, programmed for the overwhelm and anxiety that our collective society is running at this point. I think the shaking practice, if there were one thing you could do in the morning, um, would be a really fun one to explore, just to, to feel what it's like to move that out of your body and actually to feel your own vibration and hum coming out the other side. Amazing. It's a good one. And, and I do encourage people to experience the full ritual of, uh, of a Koya class because you'll get to move through all of these phases together. But I, I do have a particular love for that shaking piece. I think it's one that anyone can access at any time and get instant change in their body. Hmm. 
So I have a question about um, empowerment and leadership. I know that empowerment is a topic that you've been passionate about for many years. I remember having conversations about it all those many years ago. And I wonder how your perspective on women's leadership and feminine leadership maybe has evolved um, mm. through the process of creating Koya and through bringing your book forward. Ooh, I love this topic. Uh, one of the things that I'm really inspired about that I see as a really healthy shift is empowerment and leadership. I think the old paradigm model is like, let me rise up and everyone notice me and then emulate me. Or versus I feel like the new paradigm of leadership and the way that I teach Koya and train other women to share Koya is that you have such a deep sense of remembering that you create space for others to rise. Mm -hmm. And so your leadership is in how much you can inspire others to rise to their greatest self versus how much you can inspire others to follow you as you rise alone. You know what I mean? It's like, absolutely. and so for me, that's something I'm really passionate about is really creating opportunities for women to rise. And in Koi, it's like these things where you know, I don't teach a class and say, okay, the class is forgiveness. I basically, I figured forgiveness out. It's these seven steps. If you do them, your life will be great. Um, <laughs> I, I say, okay, the theme is forgiveness. This is where I'm interfacing with forgiveness. And then it'll be what's true in your body. And then people will partner up. And it's like, what is one thing that you've learned about forgiveness? And then everyone's like learning from each other sure. and bringing that into the movement. But it's, but it's also this idea of really empowering is just giving people a space and a context to remember the essence of who they are and bring voice to it. And so it's really just shifting from an ego to a soul perspective instead of egoic empowerment, you know, to soul empowerment, which is remembering. And at the same time, I don't want to minimize the value of the ego because it has value. So I'm not saying that in like a blanket generalized sure. statement, but just it's not empowerment. I don't think of it in the old paradigm context. Yeah, absolutely. I love that imagery too of kind of this picture of everyone having their arms and creating space, you know, like you do when you're making a circle bigger, making room yeah. for everybody. It's beautiful. Um, I, I know that there is so much truth in the word remembering, and it's a word that has meant a lot to me, and it's a word that I – come back to as a touchstone as we're talking about um, co-creation or divination or any of the many um, pieces of the mystics medicine bag. It's, it's less of a teaching and a new and more of a, these ancient truths and how we're bringing them forward in a modern context. And I know remembering is such an important cornerstone of your work as well, but I was challenged a couple of weeks ago by a mentor of mine um, who said, the, the divine feminine, this is what she said, the divine feminine was never forgotten. She has been always here, hidden in plain sight. And actually, I thought almost instantly of you, Rochelle, especially in the context of all the pilgrimage and travel you've done, because you have shared with the world via your beautiful social media and Instagram. And also, I encourage everyone to follow you just to be in the beauty way of your Instagram feed and, and be taken along on this journey. But you really have strung together the remembering from the place of all the many places where the divine feminine is in form, in representation, present in stained glass, present in art, present in temple. What is your thinking about that dance between never forgotten and remembering and hidden in plain sight and maybe coming back into sight for us. Mm -hmm. Did that land for you at all? Yes. Yeah. I okay. had a really similar experience when I went to Israel. Okay. Where I was looking for, there's a goddess called the lost goddess of Asherah. And I was like looking everywhere and I was like writing scholars and I was trying to go to temples. It's like, she wasn't anywhere. <laughs> like she was, she's called the lost goddess of Asherah. And I was like, she is most certainly lost. Like no one knows anything about her. <laughs> And so I'm on this pilgrimage and it's nothing. And then I'm going and it's obviously like a very moving place, but it's like one of the most masculine patriarchal place in every way that I've ever come across. And then, and I was feeling really disheartened because I just couldn't find any connection to the divine feminine there. And I went on a hike and it was really hot. It was like the hottest week of the whole year, like mid July. 
and we came across a swimming hole when we were hiking and I just dove into the swimming hole. And as I dove in, I heard the voice of the goddess and it was like, I'm here, I'm in nature. Like I am nature. Like there's nowhere that I cannot be like, you know, and then, and then I heard this really specifically, which was like a big thing for me. You may not see me at the wailing wall, but I am the stone. Oof. I'm getting crown chills, my friend. <laughs> and I was like, I was like that too. It was like, there's nowhere I cannot be. I'm life itself. And it's like, I don't need a big temple because I'm life. Like, <laughs> you know, I'm the material that makes the temple. I am the bodies. I am the, you know, and, uh, yeah. and so it was this really humbling, interesting for me because I realized I was coming from like a mind place of like where, you know, and being so sad that, you know, where is the divine feminine being honored, you know, because it's like, you know, the earth is being destroyed at this point, but at the same time, yeah, it's also being revered in a lot of places as well. But so I definitely hear what Mm -hmm. your mentor was saying. And I, and I definitely agree. And at the same time, if we're just going to measure like, um, divine masculine, divine feminine images of those in major religions, you know, everything has been put in a masculine context and, you know, that's just, so it just depends on what lens you're looking through. But from a spiritual sense, I would say, yeah, there's never been anything, but I think for so many of us, we're saying like, Hey, I think it's a little weird that, (laughs) that we've kind of been written out of this um this divine right to have access to god without needing um some sort of male counterpart in you know the major religions and so i think that's the place where a lot of the fiery divine feminine remembering honoring goddess circles comes to it's like i want to see my i want to see myself reflected in my culture yes yes Oh, and that brings me to my next question, which is there is still a lot of fear around bringing the divine feminine forward, that it wasn't safe, that it isn't safe, um, that it would be coming out of the closet, that people won't understand. Are we ready to use the word sacred? Um, (laughs) Elena uh, Elena Lips and Celia Ward-Wallace and I have brought together our first joint retreat under the name Sacred CEO, and we ourselves had a really long conversation of, you know, what do we mean by the word sacred? Are we ready to use the word sacred in our branding? And we are that desire to see our culture around us reflect our truths and our knowing. Um, you're, you're at an intersection point of that walking in two worlds, a bridge walker, as we call them, um, with a foot in the modern world and a foot in the world that is already awake and already sees. How do you navigate that line between those two worlds? I think for me personally is I've never been someone that was inspired in trying to convince someone of something. Mm -hmm. Like that's never been my thing. Like I'm going to go convert people. Right. I basically, it's like that lighthouse or it could be like a wolf. It's like, I'm going to howl my truth so loud that those who hear it and they recognize it as a tribe call will come. Right. So I've always felt really passionate about being as true to myself as possible so that I can then connect with the people who are in that place where versus like some people, it's like all about the message that you get. Cause some people are like, I need to go be the translator or like, you know, that bridge walker, like, right. like I j- we all serve different bridges. So like for me, Koya, like I'm very, very clear. Koya is for someone on the verge of a soul-based decision. Mm-hmm. And when they know something and they're about to make a decision, whether that's to, you know, commit to a relationship, break up, start a business, end a business, um, you know, put everything in storage, what, whatever it is. And the thing is they feel a clear call in their body. It doesn't make rational sense, but they know in their bones they have to do it. And the only thing harder than doing it is not doing it. And so I'm, I'm on the other side of that bridge of being like, Hey, I did that like 75 times. <laughs> like, You know, it's, it's cool. Like I, I walked over the bridge. I came back over to tell you, you probably want to live in a world where you can trust yourself. Yes. So so that, that's, that's my thing. Yep. I think other people, I, I don't know, I have to say this like gently, but mm-hmm. it's like not every individual person has to save the entire world. Mm-hmm. And so I really like to give people permission to listen to like what their message is and what they want to do. And, you know, I've had so many people tell me that I need to be less spiritual and I need to like, you know, like 
dumb it down or make it more like introductory. And I'm like, I have like everything in my body cringes when I think of doing that. Mm-hmm. And, um, and also when I'm speaking to someone who maybe it's like, there are people that come to my retreats that have never done any inner work. Mm-hmm. You know, my mom was one of them. Like she'd never, never done anything. And like a yoga teacher for 12 years, she never came to class. She never been to an exercise class. She never taken a course. She never been to a therapist, like nothing, 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 nothing. And, um, and the thing is for me is just like speaking to the soul, like everyone just deep respect to everyone as a soul. They might be in different levels of their cognitive integration of spiritual awareness into this realm, but like just deep bow to anyone that I get to be in front of. And I feel like when you speak to them that way in deep respect that they rise to that. Yes. And, and then if they don't, and then I also just call in a lot of guardian angel support of just like, you know, the people that are meant to be here, like, can you please bring them? And the people that it's not the right time or it's not the right message, can you please direct them to the most divinely aligned place for them? Yes. And, and I'm going at like 100% resonation rate so far. So I feel like employing, you know, guardian angels, they like, they, they like jobs. So give them something to do. They do like jobs. Oh, I love that. <laughs> I also love the 100% resonation rate. That is absolutely what we're shooting for here. And I love that you're living it and modeling it in your work. Um, well, I know that we want to have a lot of people who would like to ask questions, but I also, I just want to touch on your book before we move into questions. Will you tell us a little bit about how your baby was born and where people can find it and what it will teach them? I love also that its subtitle is the metaphor of the compass and it will resonate for everyone in this realm more. We talk so much about the wheel and our north and how the medicine wheel informs um, our business and our life and every mm. aspect. Please tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so so grateful for all the the wisdom keepers and the lineage of people who have documented the medicine wheel, the healing path, so that we could just click into it like a puzzle piece and find our right. map home. So so deep deep gratitude and um, the title of the book is Koya, A Compass for Navigating an Embodied Life that is Wise, Wild, and Free. And it does go through the cardinal directions of north, south, east, west, and the inner cardinal directions, northwest, southwest, northeast, southeast. And the cardinal directions are the masculine energy of going out into the world. So listing the physical sensation of truth in your body, doing your sacred work, following the call of the soul, living life with reverence, and then the inner cardinal are like, how do you go into your inner world? And that's accessing your inner wisdom, creativity, sensuality, and light. The inner spiral is a metaphor of a labyrinth to remember the essence of who you are and source your thoughts, feelings, and beliefs from that. Remembering each chapter has a personal story of when I was the most connected to that and when I was the most disconnected to that. So it's very raw, vulnerable, and the, the through line of that disconnection has been my relationship to the masculine, the inner masculine within me, never meeting my father, Mm -hmm. uh, dating adventures, but then also the projection of that into the world of just seeing, you know, not being able to see myself reflected in the religious spiritual traditions. So every chapter then has my stories, and I'm really inspired about people Uh, feeling what's true for them. So there's a movement, a ritual, a community connection, and a pilgrimage that Mm -hmm. takes takes them. So it's like, this is what's true for me. But like a map is just a map. Like how you travel that is uniquely yours. So I'm really proud of it. Um, It's available on my website, uh, koya.love or lifestyleofreverence.com. And it's available on Amazon. I also recorded the audio book. So it's on Audible. And um, it's also on Kindle. So in any way that you're inspired to, to go on that journey together, there's also a lot of free book resources on my website. So if you go to Koya Book Resources and it's videos and of a lot of the things that I give, um, there's pictures of like the journeys that I went on, which are kind of fun. And uh, it's, it's been, it's been probably the, definitely the most alchemizing experience of my entire life because when the book was done, it was like the book held all that energy yeah. and I felt like not even creating a new chapter, but I felt like my life was, I got to create a new book. It's like, yeah. and that was the metaphor is like when I crystallized the gifts mm-hmm. and shared them with others, then I was gifted all this free space in my life to receive 
uh, and it was, it's just that creative process of being inspired, taking it through the filter of yourself, sharing it, and then the sharing and the putting it outside of yourself, there's space to receive again. Oh my gosh, what a huge piece just dropped in from you sharing that. Um, you know, there are a lot of thought leaders in this community, and there is this unbelievable um, drive and primal urge to move that thought leadership up and out and, and crystallize that inner knowing and truth. Hadn't really had a conversation about what comes on the other side of that expression, and the idea that that creates more space for the next book is so true and accurate and clear and beautiful. Thank you for that. My pleasure. Mm -hmm. Something I could have only known by doing it. So <laughs> I'm very, very grateful. What was the most, uh, I mean, perhaps aside from that epiphany, what was, what was the most profound piece of the journey for you of that crystallization process of moving that up and out and creating it in form? Mm. Well, uh, something happened when I was recording the audiobook, mm -hmm. which is one of the most um, conscious moments of my life where I was reading the book and I was fully present in the memory of when it happened, whatever that life event was. Mm -hmm. I was fully present to being in New York City in a sound studio reading the book out loud, but I also could feel my consciousness with each person as they were reading it. Oh. And so the inner collapsing of dimensions and time space separation, yeah. you know, dissolved. And I just felt my pure awareness in that, in that oneness. And it was, you know, the, the underlying story is always love, consciousness, truth, beauty, and the, and, the, and the dance between. But I was able to feel this past, present, future melting and, and, and also just not only my story, but our story. Like I was so vulnerable. I said so many things that were so like, who decides to publish their inner life? Like I was crying to one of my friends. I'm like, what am I doing? And she's like, you know, I know it takes a lot of courage, but I have to tell you, it just sounds like a really good book. If you're, if you're having, if you're having that much like second guessing about it, you know, um, and it wasn't second guessing, but the thing for me, it was like, this isn't just like, this was my story, but like, we all have those moments of embarrassment, of betrayal, of when we could have done better, of abuse, of trauma. And it's like, the thing is, I want to live in a world where we get to be who we are and honor the experiences as they are. And I just want to stop pretending. And I'm really tired of talking to everyone else pretending. Like, <laughs> it's like, you know, at what point do we just get to tell the truth about our lives? Like, when does that actually happen? And that's the world I want to live in. And, you know, Gandhi, be the change you want to see. It's yeah. like, if I want to live in that world. I guess I'll start to create it. I better be it. Even if it's just me and like the book club of people that are reading the book, it's like, and that's happened. I've had, I've had a lot of women come up to me and say, you know, you wrote that story that happened to me. Yeah. And all of a sudden I was able to release the shame and shyness and like so much of our creative work. It's like, if it touches one human being's life, it feels like that was worth it. And so there's been a lot of icing on the cake, but the cake was definitely the healing of my own coming to right relationship with my own journey because I just like really got present with it. And then I think that becomes the consciousness that's in the book that it allows yeah. others as a gift as much as they're, they want to have that experience. Well, I, I fall back on this phrase a lot that probably came from Wendy McKenna, actually, of the, what we do for the one, we do for the all. Yes. What a perfect example of that in your story of the ripples coming from within and rippling out from that book process and the retelling via the audios. There's, it's, there's a lot of rich metaphor there. <laughs> Right? Yes. <laughs> Good. Oh, well, I want to make sure that we um, have some time here for questions. Is that okay with you, Rochelle? Of course, of course. Okay. I had Carrie Nola uh, on video here for just a moment, and I want to bring her back and introduce you to her and her um, work with her new shadow deck. And I'm sure she has a question or a reflection and just want to invite her. Hi, can, you, yeah, I can hear you. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Hi, it's great to be here. Hey, Rochelle, it's nice to meet you uh, again. I think I was first introduced to your beautiful uh, work and just art through Kate Northrup. And oh, it's fun. Yeah, it's just an honor to be back. You know, I spent most of my childhood as a dancer, and I realized as I started journeying with movement in my adult life how much it woke up in me from my childhood, my wounding that was asking to be held and heard and um, 
yeah, it's just been such a process of coming back into my body in a way that feels safe and, and true for me. And it just woke up so much and I can feel the ways that you embody this, not that you are talking it, but you're really living it. And I just, I feel that reflection in your, in your sharing. And it's just inspiring and, and inviting me to continue staying with the process um, of waking up myself and what that will mean for my work and, and my sharing and how my body can come along for the ride and to be one of my greatest teachers in the process. Mm. Aho. <laughs> well, I'm very excited to check out your shadow deck and I love hearing the process and then it culminating in an expression of art and beauty and, you know, mirroring for others, you know, it's such a powerful opportunity to, I always think of that young quote, it's like, you know, we don't deal with the shadow consciously, it comes up unconsciously, and so really allowing that and creating safe, sacred places to do it, and I can feel that in you as well, so deep bow to you and your creation. Well. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for being brave and coming on camera, Carrie. I really appreciate it. I do love your shadow deck so much. I can see your worlds weaving a lot in the future. Oh, thank you, Rochelle. Yeah. I look forward to meeting you in person. I've got one of your retreats on my on my radar, so we're going to oh. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. I look forward to that as well. Blessings. You too. <laughs> Thanks, Lindsay, for the space. Yeah, thank you, Carrie. Elena's got her hand up. I'm going to unmute you, love. Elena Lipson, Rochelle Sheik. I'm so glad you guys are on live call together. I know. So this is really fun for me, actually, because I got your book, Rochelle. Um, Can you guys hear Elena okay? Yes. Okay, yeah. good. Okay. So I got your book when you were doing your Kickstarter campaign, and then in the, the book came those really cool little cards, the reverence mm -hmm. cards. And so I have that sitting on my desk in the inspiring people corner. Mm. Here we are connecting. So magic. Really afoot, so it's really beautiful. Um, so I just wanted to thank you for your practice and the Koya that you do. I've been practicing my morning practice and teaching it to my circle for several years now. And about, I don't know, a year and a half, two years ago, I, I can't even remember how Koya came into my life, but it's been such a blessing. And I practice the expanding your ability to receive at least three times a week. It's <laughs> part of my core practice. Wow. And yeah, it's, it's, and I point my ladies to you as much as possible because between the dancing and the shaking mm -hmm. and the circling, it's really, I mean, I talk about embodiment quite a bit as well. And so it's been such a huge gift to me personally and as something I can point the women to because while I dance and I move, I don't teach that as a core teaching. So I love to be able to point to what you do as such a beautiful practice. Mm. So my question to you is, I'm curious, since you have such a rich spiritual life, what does your morning practice look like and feel like? I'm sure it evolves mm -hmm. depending on where you are. Oh, and the other thing is I took your book with me to Costa Rica where I set an intention to go to one of your retreats, but I got to read it there. And yes, it was, I laughed. Mm -hmm. I, I like, there was a moment where I was like, oh, oh my God, she's writing about that. It was, so, it was so freeing in so many ways because I, I think so many of us who are out there on Facebook and teaching, there's a part of us that we sometimes don't show. And mm -hmm. so I totally honor you for sharing that raw part that just, it, it felt like it instantly connected me to you. So whatever you were doing in that sound booth, well done. <laughs> <laughs> so um, back to the question is really, I'm curious, you know, what does your morning practice look like, feel like, does it evolve or change? I'd love to mm. like, a peek into it. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much for your support with the Kickstarter. I so appreciate that was like one of the best experiences of my life was having that. Thank you so much for um, your reflection with the book and with the practices and for sharing them. It means a lot to me. So thank you for bringing that forward. And uh, with the practice, I always feel like with these morning practices, it's like we want to hold them like with, um, with reverence for structure and then we also want to hold them really gently and in a feminine way. So I have a practice where first thing I roll over and I go into child's pose and I count 10 gratitudes on my hands. And then I go into half pigeon and think of something I'm celebrating on both sides. And I go into like uh, a back bend and I vision for the day. So that takes about like five, six minutes. And that's what I do. Um, like just first thing out of bed. But then 
I do my best to really tune into the moment and what's right for the moment. So like sometimes that's going off to a yoga class, sometimes that's doing koi movement, sometimes it's meditation, sometimes it's writing, sometimes it's making out, <laughs> sometimes it's like, you know, like really tuning in of like what, what in this moment will bring me into balance and what in this moment is like the most ecstatically joyful thing I can do. And sometimes it's like, there's this, this idea of like, I need to have these daily practices in place for when I'm not inspired to do them, that I just do it every day. Like I, I, I go for a walk every morning. I meditate every morning. Da, 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 da. So sometimes people really, really need that. But if you're in a place where you're, you're trustworthy enough for your own daily practices, I feel like the question is what will bring me the most ecstatic joy and like the most fun that I'm like, I'm stoked to be alive and like do that. Oh gosh. <laughs> I, this is, I just have to jump in and say that just resonates so much. So much of Elena's work is around the sacred promises and honoring the promises you make to yourself first and that trustworthiness mm. and trusting in your ability to not only honor your core routines in the morning, but to trust that you can let them be what they want to be that morning. It's so mm -hmm. huge. Yeah, like I, I just and, and, and also, I think I should also preface this by saying, like, I have so much Gemini in my chart. Like, it's like sun, moon, Venus. So, like, if you were to ask someone else with a different – I mean, I love astrology, but, like, the, the key word for my existence is, like, variety, movement, change. Yeah. So, like – like that, like a, a, some, like there's such medicine in having those daily things and like the stability and the structure of those. And that's just not my medicine, but it's yeah. good medicine. Yeah. It's like, and so I have like some little things and that's the place where maybe I could grow and learn and sign up for a course um, <laughs> because I'm just like, like a hummingbird is like, where's the next pretty flower? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm an Aquarius, but I'm an, a, a huge lover of all things Gemini. We have a very heavily Gemini skewed community. <laughs> <laughs> it's wonderful. <laughs> Elena, thank you so much for your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a little nudge from our friend Sarah Love here. Let me go ahead and take you and unmute you, Love, and we, there she is. Hey, Sarah. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Well, thank you, Lindsay, for turning me on to Koya in that hotel room in Seattle where <laughs> we didn't have a lot of time to do big morning practice. And you said, okay, five-minute video, shaking, get up, <laughs> mm -hmm. do this. And I've been tuning in ever since to your work, Rochelle. So it's pretty oh. powerful, and I love it. Um, and I, I just needed to pop in here because at the beginning of the call – you said the words, I stand for love, and that is um, my business, my mission, my domain name, my whole umbrella for my mm. and my movement and my life. And so I just had to make this connection and ask you, what, uh, what does that mean for you when, when you say that? I'd love mm. to know. What a beautiful question. I'm just brought into this moment of like, May 17th in the middle of the afternoon. What does it mean? I stand for love. It sounds like a Khalil Gibran poem. <laughs> and so I feel like for me, there's been so many moments where there's seems to be a fork in the road and it splits. And it's like, what do you believe in? And it's like, is it, you know, is it love? Is it fear? Is it, is it, truth or is it illusion and regardless of any appearances at the end of the day what do you hold to be the most sacred what do you give your hope your faith to and it's interesting that in a western context love and when we use that word can sometimes be hijacked by you know fantasy romanticism but at the end of the day, at the middle of the day, at the beginning of the day, I believe that there's so many of us who, who know that this is our essence and this is why we're here and the joy of the perseverance to believe and serve and protect that 
that thing that can't be put into words, but love is as close as we're probably going to get in this moment um, is everything. And so it's like to say I stand for love is to be like, I stand for you. I stand for me. I stand for her. I stand for trees. I stand for the ocean. I stand for birth. I stand for death. I stand, you know, it's like, it's like, to me, it's like love is equal signs, everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everything is equal signs, love. And there's a real limitation to language and conveying these ideas in some ways. That's why I've become so passionate about embodiment because it's like, you know, we can talk around it. We can get to the center of it, but it's like when you feel it, you know it. And it's like, you know, the light comes in the window in the morning and there's just something that changes, you know, it's like the warmth of your beloved's body in bed. And there's just something there, the contagious laughter of a child, you know, you're on a road trip adventure and there's this open expanse of mountains. It's like, there's these just moments where it's, we drop into something that is impenetrably true. And I stand for that. Mm. Oof. Thank that you. Was poetry. Yeah. <laughs> mm. I'm seeing a series in your future, Sarah, where you can have people sharing their platform of what it means to stand for love. Mm. It's really beautiful. Well, um, not to put you on the spot, but I just had a <laughs> lightning bolt um, hit me with I Stand for Love Day. So I created an international day on August mm. 8, 8, 8. That's I Stand for Love Day. And um, I've been looking to do like a global video or something on that day that's more than just the social media but actually brings people together and so I'll send you a, a private message but I don't know if there's a date we can just shake the whole world on August 8th but whoo that would be something amazing I love that that's my grandpa's birthday oh <laughs> it's a sign yeah, yeah. and yeah. I'll get in touch with you thank you that was a beautiful answer too because my whole you know days and nights are kind of revolving around articulating yes that and so it and it changes every day but it is that kind of grasping of like something so big but you're you pointing to the crossroads is really where it's at is every moment we have that choice and we come you know this way or that way and when we choose love and love is the true north yeah. then then that's really the stand in itself so thank you uh, yummy thank you both i think we can squeeze in maybe one more question and um i know that we had celia interested in asking a question are you still do you still have a question my love let me see if I can unmute you. I think Terry may have raised her hand. We may have to do some questions offline as well. We can. Or, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. hey, hey, everybody. Um, Rochelle, I live in San Fernando Valley in LA. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering if you're going to, um, if there's ever going to be any classes up here. I know that there are some in Santa Monica or Venice, mm -hmm. and I wish there were some closer to this area. Yeah, that really depends on people coming to the teacher training, like maybe you, and then teaching them. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> that, I would good. love to. I, I've been thinking about it, and um, just this past year has been a lot. So, you know, maybe yeah. sometime soon within the next year or two, I would love yeah. to. But in the meantime, it would be great if somebody else is in this area. That yeah. I... I don't know of anyone there right now. So uh, there, there are 200 teachers that have gone through the training and um, there definitely will always be more, but I don't, um, I wish there could be a Koya teacher in every community, but I don't really assign or push. Sure. I just support people in their desire. And, uh, but we do have an intro to teacher training online. So that's like how to guide yourself through your own home practice. And then there's, um, an initiation training is like how to teach your friends and family. Then there's an intensive on how to like, if you want to start teaching to the public. So if you're, and then there's all those free videos online. I know it's fun in person, but, but yeah. there's tried to create a lot of support for people when they're in situations with desire, but there's not a teacher in their area. Right. I've been definitely checking it out because I'm like the Pied Piper around here of your shaking video. <laughs> Everybody that's going through stress or, or whatever their situation is, but especially mm -hmm. stress, I, I highly suggest it. 
It's, it's just fascinating that you can move your body with an intention to release and you can completely shift your reality in three to four minutes. I mean, it's just, I, right. every time I do it, I'm like, this is just amazing that this works. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> and it's fun. It's so fun. It's like, and it's really fun when you can also really notice the subtle energy shifts. Like when you start shaking and it's like literally five seconds and it's like, what? It's, I don't, I, I'm, I'm mesmerized by it. Yeah, mm-hmm. me too. I mm-hmm. love it. You. Thanks. Great. Terry. Thank you. And Terry, get to a retreat. That's my other thought. I can mm-hmm. see you in Costa Rica with Rochelle. <laughs> I would love to. Well, um, I had mentioned Celia as well. I'm going to go ahead and unmute Celia, and then we'll use this as our closing question. Hey, Celia. Hey. Yes, we can hear you. Um, uh, well, so excited to be on the call with all of you guys. And as you guys know, I too, I'm a big, big uh, promoter of Koya. And Aww. <laughs> work works with women on all levels in their, in their journey. But a lot of the women are everyday women and, and really just the nine to five gals, you know, going to work and coming home. And um, a lot of what comes up in our work with them is this piece around the trauma. Mm. Um, and, you know, as we're trying to help them figure out their purpose and start new businesses and live a, a soulfully aligned life, it's like the, the meat of what we always get into is like, holy crap, I have all these blocks, all this emotional stuff is coming up for me. I can't move forward because I've been through abuse or I've been through, um, you know, molestation or something like that. And so that's where your piece has really come in. Um, big for us around the movement piece about, you know, just moving the trapped energy. And we've brought in one of your teachers, who's one of our soul sisters, Dawn Gibson, Mm -hmm. for my sort of signature program. She did all of the training videos around movement. And so just really wanted to, first of all, just thank you for that. Also make you aware that that's how we're using it in my program, as well as just really, I guess, reflecting on this piece of it's great when people are really highly conscious and aware of the work and are looking for morning practices and come to your work. But at the same point, I feel like, you know, do you have thoughts about how to bring this to the more mainstream outer ring everyday woman that, you know, could benefit so much from the use of, of this for, you know, releasing their trauma? Mm. I think that, well, thank you so much. Um, and, I'm, I'm so happy. That makes me uh, just ecstatic that you have that connection to Dawn because I know that's really like her specialty as a therapist and then bringing the movement in and that's incredible. And then the mainstream piece is, you know, I guess I, I, I'm doing it in the ways that I know how to do it. It's like I have all those free videos online and so just making it really accessible that anyone who hears about it can do that in terms of like um, – you know, I'm, I've never done any marketing. And so it's like when you talk about like making it bigger, like that's just like, those aren't the messages that I get. And it's not that I don't want to share. I want to share in every way that I know how. And so it's been really getting the message out there is like, here's the book, here are free videos, training teachers in all these different cities so that people can have those experiences. But then also, um, knowing for me that like the message that I get is often, it's not about how big you can take it. It's about how deep you can take it. And if you can keep it at a level where it actually changes and impacts people's lives, it will grow organically at the pace and way in which ambassadors can hold it. And so that's, that's sort of been the way that I've been. It's like, yeah, it's, it's Koi is not in every, you know, it's not a household name, but it's held in depth. Like if you go to a Koya class, the teachers are there and then it can grow as much as people are inspired to share it. And, you know, the book exists and the videos exist. And then, um, I'm always, you know, working on my own ability to expand and grow, but it's, um, and I, I can't change Koya. So in terms of like the modern everyday woman, but I really, I really believe that it it's, I, I, I don't know. I, in some ways I live in such a bubble because I don't think I'm, I'm totally, um, and at the same time, I have lots of friends who have, you know, the traditional lifestyles who come on retreats that there's lots of women who have never done anything before and they come and they have a fully remembering experience without any prep work. So I guess, yeah, I'm open to any other ideas or blind spots that I'm not seeing, but that's just where I am right now. 
Yeah, no, I think your answer is really helpful. And I do think the ambassador piece is huge. You know, if, if I know that I'm an ambassador for um, being a voice of many people's work to bring to the community. Mm -hmm. and, um, you know, I, I know I'm very deeply connected with Lindsay, so I know down the line we'll connect more with you and continue the conversation. So just in the meantime, mm. know that um, the everyday woman is experiencing your work, whether it's mm. through you or through us out there in the world. That's powerful. I'm just about to go into a week-long intensive teacher training, so it's like a really big gift in my heart to infuse and transmit to the women of like the opportunity of you know, of what we're actually able to do in the sacred spaces in which we're actually able to meet in those moments when you get to sit with a woman in her life and what really matters most and, and really healing, embracing, growing, expanding, supporting. And so I definitely feel every woman that I've heard, you know, ask a question, Lindsay herself, and then also just energetically tuning in is just what an amazing community you have all created and offered to each other. And I feel so honored to be introduced to each of you and look forward to um, supporting one another and growing together in all realms. I look forward to that too. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you. I know I want to honor everybody's time. I know we've gone a little over here and I want to thank you all for your willingness to stretch time here with us. Um, just in closing, Rochelle, where's the best place for people to find you and follow you for this next chapter, this next book that will, will come forward? Is it, um, is it via social media or on your list or all of the above? Uh, all, all the above is good. Koya.love is, is like the main hub, the website. Um, the Koya.love is also an Instagram. My personal Instagram is Rochelle Chic. There's all the Facebook, the, you know, all the things. Yes, <laughs> yes. All the things. Yes. Uh, but, uh, but would love, would love to stay, would love to stay connected for sure. Well, really appreciate that. And so grateful for your time. I want to, um, Thank all of you who joined us and all, do, all of you who will find us um, via the replay as well. I want to give a shout out to Leon and Karen, also our sweet mama figures for being here and holding the energies that you do, um, passing the baton, as we say, Karen, and being here for this um, young goddesses story. Thank you, too. And um, I want to go ahead and release us now. We didn't formally bring ourselves into oneness of heart and mind. We had a little... Um, tech hiccups at the very beginning and I didn't formally call in the directions or give thanks but I'd like to acknowledge that we found our way into the sacred space mm -hmm. together and we found our way into oneness of heart and mind and so I'm going to go ahead and release us now and release all of the teachers and energies that joined us and supported us to hear each other clearly and to see things in new ways and release us so we can go forward and laugh our own laughs and dream our own dreams knowing we can tap back into this basket whenever and however we so desire. May you be well guided, well protected, and blessed, everyone. I'm going to unmute you all so you can all say goodbye. Michael, thank you again so much for all you're doing in the world. Thank you, Rochelle. Thank you. Thank you. Bless so much love. Thank you all. Thank you for your great questions, and thank you for your love. See you online, everyone. Thank you.